Let's play a game of what's in the box, antique sword style. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator and Eastern Antique Arms. Now, as many of you know, as well as running this YouTube channel, I am also an antique dealer, primarily antique swords, but also sometimes guns and bayonets and other things as well, but mostly swords. Uh, today I've actually been on a few errands to pick up a bunch of swords. So where do I obtain antique swords from? Uh, mostly auctions, uh, private sales, um, things that people are clearing out. Um, also, you know, people who are thin thinning out or changing their collections, this kind of thing. So I buy from a number of different places, including from businesses and from private owners as well. And today I picked up a bunch of swords. Now. I often arrange to collect things and then once I've looked at them through photographs and given, you know, prices and stuff like that, I then it exits my brain what it was I was actually collecting. I just have a list of swords and I, I box them up, I throw them in the car and I drive home again. So what I've got here is a box of, I think, 14 swords and they've come from two different places and I thought it'd be fun rather than me just taking them out and cataloguing them and putting them into my inventory. Um, if I unbox them with you and I can go through and say a few things as I pull them out. I'm not going to say a huge amount about each sword because clearly there's 14 of them, uh, but nevertheless, let's have a quick look and see what I've got in my box. And also briefly to mention, of course, this stock will be finding its way to my website, but before that, it's going to be with me at the Antique Arms Fair in London, which is February the 4th, Saturday, February the 4th. Um, if you're in London, come down, say hi, maybe buy a sword from me or one of the other fantastic dealers who are gonna be at that arms fair. I'll stick a link below to the arms fair. Uh, you can pre-order tickets if you want to do that or you can pay on the door when you get there. Um, but I will be there with probably most of, possibly all of these swords and a bunch of others as well. So first up from my box, it's, well, what is it? It looks like a French 1882 um, infantry officer's sword. Um, but the guard has a reinforce on it. It doesn't look like the typical nickel uh, version. Um, yeah, although it's very dirty by the way, all of these will be uh, cleaned. Oh, okay. Oh yes, I remember this from the photo. So this is a very unusual blade. This is, if you notice here, it's a pipe back. Oh, it smells of, smells of gun oil. That's really nice mineral oil. <laughs> you get these on antique swords, you get a smell of oil that you just don't seem to get from most modern oils. Um, yeah, so it's a pipe back section blade. It has been really well server sharpened. Wow, um, that's edged all the way down to there. So it's been really well server sharpened and the tip is still very sharp. And it has, interesting, it has various markings on it. Um, oh wow, it says made of English superior steel. Well, that's pretty unusual. This is written in French. I'm translating acier, anglais. Acier is steel. Anglais, English. Um, I have never seen a French sword being marked as made of English steel before. And it says Manufacture GP, Châteauroux, which is one of the main uh, arms factories along with uh, Klingenthal. Um, out, uh, what's out? Is that August? Um, 1914. Wow, so, that is, so that's a World War I sword made of pipe back, made of superior English steel. I, Never ever seen a French sword like that before. Right, I'd like to talk more about this sword, but I've got to move. Oh, it's got a wooden grip. That's the other thing that's unusual about it. These are usually horn. But anyway, yeah, there we go. Let's move on to the next sword. Um, we've got another French one here. In fact, these came from the same place. Um, the person, oh wow. Oh, wow, that's interesting. So, a nice pair of swords. So, at first sight, this looks like an 1882 infantry. Um, but actually, it's a bit more interesting than that because it has a, an iron hilt, a steel hilt, with quite substantial um, sort of back piece and pommel, um, and it has two bar instead of a three bar on the side, and it has a broader than usual cannula blade. So this type of blade where you have a fuller at the back on one side, but the fuller is at the front on the other side. So if you imagine the cross section, it's kind of doing this, it's corrugated, which means you can end up with a very stiff but very light blade. Um, and it's broader at the base than the typical 1882 is. And let's look at the manufacturer, oh, it says Klingenthal, um, with, I think, what is a Belgian um, proof mark on it. 
but very, very, very interesting sword. So not a typical 1882, possibly something like Chasseurs d'Afrique, um, so French chasse, um, North African Chasseurs. Uh, it's got one ring, so it's probably, it's rather than two rings on the scabbard, so it's probably 1890s up to World War One. But an interesting sword, so neither of them technically <laughs> are the 1882 pattern, which I thought they were, they're actually a little bit more unusual than that, but they're both in quite rough condition and they need, well, not rough, but they need, they're dirty, untouched, they need a little bit of a clean up, but very interesting swords. Let's look at the next one. So next up, we've got a British sword. At first sight, it looks like it's gonna be Royal Artillery. Um, and it's got an 1895 pattern, fully checkered back strap or back piece, a George V marked um, so yes, at first sight, it's a pretty much standard, quite a common pattern, but quite nice because it's still got the 1845 type cut and thrust blade on it, although they are straight or very nearly straight. Some are slightly curved, this is straight. Um, so this is World War I Royal Artillery Officer's Sword in the Field Service uh, Sam Brown compatible uh, scabbard. So in fact I had family in the Royal Artillery in World War One, so they would have, uh, the officers anyway at least, would have had a, this type of sword uh, at the beginning of World War One. By about 1915 pretty much all officers had stopped carrying swords uh, in the Royal Artillery and the Infantry. Cavalry of course still had them, uh, but the order was given around 1915 for officers to stop carrying swords. I've covered this in previous videos, primarily because it made them a target for German and other enemy snipers or marksmen. Um, so swords were still used by cavalry and certainly in trench fighting hand weapons were still used but swords were just seen as too much of, a, of a, um, an emblem of officers and of course officers had a much higher death rate in the first uh, couple of years of the war than other soldiers because they were specifically targeted by marksmen. Next up we have got an 1897 infantry British, this is British infantry officers sword. This is still the current pattern in use today by, uh, by infantry officers. Now interestingly, if we look at the hilt, come close to the camera there, if you see there it says G-R-I, so that's George Rex Imper Imperius? Imperator, that's right. Um, and so that means that so a typical British infantry officer at this time would just have GR or there or GVR in fact for George V. So this is George V's period, so World War I era, 1910 onwards. But because it's got GRI, that tells us this was for a British officer in the Indian Army, not in the British Army. So this would have been someone initially in India, although of course in World War I a whole load of the Indian Army came over to Europe and fought in Belgium and France. So and many of them fought in the Middle East as well um, in uh, the, uh, well, in that campaign. Um, so against the Turks. So um, yes, let's have a look at the, let's see if we can see the, oh, it's made by Pillin. So Pillin uh, in the proof slug there, you can see there's a little proof slug in there. It's a brass disc inside a recess. Uh, it has the letter P. Uh, and that shows us that the maker of this blade is Pillin. Very good manufacturer, a rival to some extent of Wilkinson, not as big as Wilkinson but certainly as good quality as Wilkinson, and ultimately Wilkinson bought out Pellin's company, uh, so they became part of, uh, and this has been, uh, oh yeah, it's been well server sharpened actually. So this is, at first sight, you'll think of this as a thrusting sword, and it is primarily, but they were designed to cut as well, and they were edged, and this has been sharpened from there all the way to the tip. So this almost certainly, given that it's George V's reign, so it must be 1910 onwards, the very large likelihood is this was taken in 1914, to the either the Western Front or possibly down to the Middle East. And this was carried by a British officer in the Indian Army and um, expected to be used. Whether it was or not, we'll never know. Um, and the retailer for this is uh, W. Clark and Sons of Sackville Street, London. When you see me refer to a maker and a retailer, uh, Clark and Sons there were essentially a military outfit. So they're where you go to buy your uniform, your belt, maybe binoculars, boots riding apparel, this kind of stuff, and you would buy your sword from there. But the actual maker of the sword in this case is Pillin. So they bought in swords from good makers, sometimes not good makers, and then they retailed them with their own uh, kind of name etched onto the base of the blade there. So a nice, clean, good example of an 1897 pattern uh, with some nice um, service sharpening. So next up we have another 1897 pattern, but this is what I would call 
wartime quality. So um, not to say it's terrible or unusable or anything like that, it is just not as good quality as that Pillin example. So Pillin were a sword maker that went all the way back into the, uh, well, all the way back through the 19th century. And they'd been making swords throughout the Victorian era and were still therefore making good quality swords in World War One. However, in World War One, just like in World War Two, there was a shortage of materials. And a lot of people who manufactured other things had to turn their hands to manufacturing things for the war effort. So, uh, you know, uh, people who'd been making uh, maybe things to do with steam locomotives, they moved over to making things for tanks. People who'd been making bicycles turned their hand to making aeroplanes, and in some cases, firearms. Um, and motorbike manufacturers started making Enfield rifles, um, and, or, or, and, and after the war they went back to making motorbikes. Um, and in this case, in Sheffield, so you probably heard of Sheffield steel or Sheffield Bowie knives, Sheffield was famous for knife making, not for sword making. The sword making centres of Britain were Birmingham and London. Uh, but Sheffield in World War I went, oh damn, <laughs> there's a massive demand for um, officers' swords, partly because officers were dying at such a high rate, and every time an officer got commissioned into the military, joined the military, they wanted their own sword for parade purposes, but also bear in mind, despite what we now know about World War I, at that time, officers thought that a sword was going to be a weapon in, that they were going to use in war. So they wanted a sword of their own, um, and um, so the Sheffield makers took up making of, uh, making of swords. And they're not bad, um, they're functional, but they are just not as good quality. They feel clunkier in the hand, they're a little bit rougher made, they tend to, uh, the guards just uh, not quite shaped quite as nicely, a um, little bit sort of, I don't know, bulbous shaped. Um, the etching on the blades is, actually the etching is usually pretty good, I have to say, but basically they're not, these were people who were knife makers who turned their hand, in many cases they were making knives and forks, you know, table cutlery normally, and they turned their hands to making swords. Not to say the steel isn't good, I'm sure in many cases it was excellent. So here we have a Sheffield, actually the etching on this looks pretty good. Um, and it says made in England on it, but I would say almost certainly made in Sheffield. Um, and this is a World War I era, it's marked on the front of the guard there, GVR for George V, 1910 onwards, but this is almost certainly made during 1914 to 18. And there we go, it is what it is. Um, there are lots of them around, they're one of the most uh, affordable and easily obtainable uh, antique swords that you can lay your hands on these days. Now here's something I'm not sure that I've ever owned of once uh, ever before. I've, I've handled loads of these and I've seen them around. They're not that uncommon in the UK, but for obvious reasons you're going to see a second, they're not as common as British swords in the UK. And that is, do you know what it is? I'm so, sure some of you are shouting at the screen, you know exactly what it is. It's American! Um, it's a US officer's sword, US infantry officer's sword, 1902 pattern. Now this was in many ways inspired by French models of sword, the 1882. So if we look at the uh, guard and we look at the back piece, this is clearly inspired by the French 1882. However, a difference is you'll notice these finger grooves here in the horn grip, very characteristic of the American 1902 pattern. And um, that style of grip, I don't really know where they got the inspiration from exactly, but there are certain Italian swords which have that, and Italian fencing was had gained some traction in America. So, and French swords, as you may know from watching my channel, French swords had always been copied in America. So the famous sort of US Civil War cavalry saber is modeled on the French earlier, French cavalry saber. So, um, not so surprising that they copied, and in fact, uh, American uniforms are copied from French as well. Not so surprising that they copied, in general, a French sword, but it is interesting that they copied this grooved grip, and I don't know the history behind that. But also interesting is that they went with a rather narrow, but curved, slightly curved, blade. Um, so unlike the French, and most people in the world at this time, who'd moved to straight thrusting blades, whilst you can still obviously thrust very effectively with this, it is not straight. It is a curved blade, it's a sabre, but it's a very narrow and very light, very quick sabre. It handles almost, I won't say like a modern Olympic fencing sabre, but by military sabre standards, this is very, very light. I mean, you can see how quickly I can wiggle this. I can't wiggle a French or a British sword as quickly as that. This is really, really nimble and light. Um, and it's got some lovely etching on the blade. I, you won't probably be able to see that um, in frame, well you might be able to, but it's a very nice condition blade. It says 
the Defender trademark, um, the Army and Navy, and it says NS Mayer, New York. So this was retailed by Mayer of New York, um, and I don't know who made it, but it does have a proved mark. Now it's interesting that the Americans copied the British six-pointed star, which I've done videos about, and the proved mark. That is directly inspired by um, British, in this case, Thurkel, um, proved mark. So interesting, we've got many different, na much like America itself, many different nations contributed to the design of this sword. Definitely French, definitely British, possibly a bit of Italian, and a little bit of um, American um, <laughs> own kind of inspiration as well mixed in there. Very interesting sword and nice that it's got the original sword knot still attached. So we've got here another World War I era 1897 pattern officer sword. This is in particularly nice condition. The scabbard's a little bit scrappy, but the blade itself is in lovely uh, bright condition. And what's immediately notable <laughs> when you pull this sword out is, I mean, I handle a lot of these 1897s. They're pretty much the most common pattern around. But this is really beefy blade. Um, now, a lot of the Sheffield made swords are quite beefy in the blade, basically because the people that made them weren't really sword makers, they were knife makers. However, this appears to have the, it's got an R in a circle of proved on the proof slug. And I believe that relates to um, possibly the Reeves, the, re the revived Reeves mark that was used by Wilkinson. So I suspect this is actually a Wilkinson made sword under a different trademark for retail to, um, to an outfitter. Um, but I might be wrong on that. I'm not 100% sure about the R mark. And it says GVR on the front there for George V. Um, but it's unusually beefy and you've still got quite a lot of meat up here in the cutting portion of the blade, which, you know, obviously this is optimized for thrusting this type of sword. But I've got to say, let's just look at the, look, look at the point of balance on that. It's about six inches from the, from the guard. Um, so this is actually in the hand. This doesn't feel like a typical 1897 at all. It's got a lot of blade presence and extra blade, blade width. And I would say it's slightly broader at the base than usual as well. Uh, nice condition, shagreen grip. It's lost most of the grip wire, unfortunately, but everything's nice and tight. Um, so actually, you know, some people might not like this pattern, but I actually think it's a pretty good fighting sword. Now we've seen what the French, the British, and the Americans were using in the First World War. Now let's see what the Germans were using. It was one of these, the uh, infantry officers anyway. So this is the um, 1889, yes, that's right, the 1889 pattern, as it was called Degen. Now Degen's a funny word because uh, it means dagger, actually. Uh, however, in 19th century terminology for swords in Germany, a sable is a saber, and a straight sword like a spadroon was called a Degen. Um, and I believe a small sword is a stoss. Um, so this is well, this was called a degen anyway. So it's essentially a spadroon. So you'll notice that the blade is dead straight. It's quite narrow. We'll see in a minute. But the characteristic things to look for with a German sword is number one, you'll have this uh, imperial eagle down there. Get my face out of focus. There we go. Let's try and get the hilt on focus instead of my face. There we go. The imperial eagle there. Unless they fall off, you get the imperial emblem up here as well um, with Kaiser Wilhelm I think um, and sometimes they, this section here is folding so sometimes this section can fold up flat to make it more convenient to wear under a great coat for example and then fold down when you're using it this one is actually solid this is a solid guard and it is slightly bent inwards um, so someone might have fallen fallen soldier shot, uh, who knows, uh, falling off a horse or just dropped or bashed, who knows. Um, but it's been slightly squashed this way, which does mean, actually it doesn't matter too much because where your hand goes is there. Now, one of the other characteristic things about the German 1889 is this very angled grip. Now, interestingly, the Russians copied that as well. So if you see a sword that has almost got two angles to it, it comes up straight here and then the pommel cap, can you see this is a, like an isolated cap like the French sword? is at a, at a sort of 45 degree angle to the line of the grip, so it comes up straight, then it kicks off. Those are usually gonna be German, Prussian, sometimes Bavarian, other uh, German states, but it's probably a World War I era German sword. Or it's gonna be a Russian sword, or <laughs> one of the um, less powerful countries that was in the political 
and economic spheres of either Prussia or, um, or Russia. So for example, I think you can get grips like this in places like Serbia, also in Persia, which was heavily, uh, and Iran today, heavily in bed with Russia economically uh, and opposed to Britain and France. Um, so politics and economics always play a part in sword design at this time. And whoever you kind of saw as the imperial power that you aspired towards or were allied with, so like America and France, you often copied their uniform styles and their sword styles. Um, so like Persia looked up to Russia, America looked up to France at that time. Remember, economically, France was bigger than America at that point. Um, and a few countries looked up to Britain. Uh, so obviously there were, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, funnily enough, Austrian and Swiss and British swords share some uh, design um, inspirations, but there there were certain um, smaller places that did copy uh, British sword design to some extent as well. So um, anyway, there we go. That is the oh, let's have a look at the blade. So there we go. It's a straight blade. It's single edged, like a narrow back sword essentially. So it's really a spadroon, and you'll notice it has double fullers. Um, they're quite nice these blades. I like them actually. As a spadroon, they they seem to work really well. They've got some some degree of cutting potential. I would say better than a British 1898, and they can thrust pretty well because they're straight. Although they are much more flexible than either the British or French swords. So I personally would say, despite the fact that this is a primarily a thrusting sword, I would say that the German 1889 is not as good as the British 1897 or the French 1882. I think they're better designs as thrusting swords. Um, and also they've both got more hand protection than the German one does here. But it has to be said at this point, German infantry officers were discouraged from using their swords, I think. They, they had very good pistol technology. Obviously things like the broom handle Mauser and, and Luger and stuff were coming in, certainly by the First World War. So really the beginnings of modern, modern magazine fed semi-auto pistols were really leading the way in Germany. And I think they really relegated the sword for in infantry officers by that point. So next up is another American 1902. I'd actually forgotten there were two of these in here. Now it's interesting, I'm not gonna say an awful lot about the 1902 in this case because we've already looked at one. But this is an interesting one because it is nowhere near as good quality as the other one. So just like buying, I don't know, watches or kitchen knives, you can get premium quality, you can get average quality, you can get budget, <laughs> bargain basement. Um, and I would say this is further down the quality spectrum. Um, not the bottom, but much further down the other one. The other one is up near the top, I would say, and this one's much, much lower down. What's interesting though, is that while the basic pattern and design is the same, funnily enough, the it's NS Mayer of New York is also the retailer. So it's actually from exactly the same retailer as the other 1902, but what's interesting is this is a different trademark. And this one says colonial trademark, made in USA. So this is made in America. I have a sneaking suspicion because of the proof mark, the other one, the better quality one, was made in Britain. It doesn't say on it, but it also, importantly, doesn't say made in USA on it. So I know that in America they did import swords from France, um, that like French made but to American designs, uh, in from France, from Germany, from Solingen, and also from Britain. And you can actually get Wilkinson swords to American patterns that are very, very good quality. And it has to be said, British swords at this time were, were very good quality. Um, so this is American made, to colonial trademark and it's got all of the, it's got the US, uh, you know, emblem up here. It's got, you know, it's got an eagle on that side. All of the American stuff, but just the constructional quality of it, it's just not as good as the other one. It's a little bit more, not the fit and finish is, well, the finish is good, but the fit is not so quite so good between the back strap and the ferrule. The blade, um, Fullers, for example, are terminated just not quite as nice and tidily and crisply as the other one. Um, so essentially, this is for an officer who just didn't want to spend that much money on their sword. It was it would have been a cheaper option in the shop. So you went in when you graduated from West Point or wherever, you go into the outfitters in New York and you would go, OK, do you want to spend uh, $20 on a sword or do you want to spend $100 on a sword? And in this case, this would have been maybe, a, you know, the, the $30 option and the other one might have been a $90 option. Next up is another British 1897. Again, 
this is completely typical of batches of swords, whether it's auction or, or you know house sale that come to me. 1897 patterns are the most common because of World War One, only because of World War One. Actually, the British Army was much smaller. Um, in let's say 1912 than it had been earlier so there should be less officers swords but World War One happened and boom suddenly all the you know all of the militia and volunteers and all of the people signing up to uh, to become soldiers meant that there was a massive explosion of number of uh, people just like we see today in war zones in places like Ukraine for example so um, this is a George V marked, uh, so almost certainly World War I, and this is um, reasonable quality. It seems to be a nice quality blade. It's got the fleur de lis, for anybody who knows what I'm talking about, the fleur de lis on the proof slug, which means that we don't know which maker it's from, but it could be British or it could be imported. Now, prior to World War I, a lot of imported swords came from Solingen. However, it's extremely unlikely that this is uh, imported from Solingen after 1914. So I don't know where it's from, or it could have been a, a sword that was held in stock. But one thing that is interesting about this sword, which makes it different to a typical 1897 is, and I don't know whether you'll be able to see this on screen, but let's give it a try. Come on, let's focus on the blade. There we go. Can you see that? The wings, the lightning bolts, royal, engineers there we go so this is for a royal engineers officer uh, rather than a typical infantry officer and that does make it more desirable because royal engineers officers essentially it was harder to be a royal engineers officer than most other types of officer they tend to be the cleverest you had to be good at maths so you had to pass exams um, and often royal engineers officers i've got some good examples behind me uh, went on to have quite successful careers high up in the military because they were clever um, and well educated and because they were very good at things like siege engineering but also designing new types of artillery so lots of the innovations in uh, you know naval guns or, or uh, naval defense guns or uh, you know field field artillery were devised by royal artillery uh, royal engineers officers also bridge building fortifications all of this kind of stuff so um because it was harder to be a Royal Engineers officer and because there were fewer of them and because they were more elite, Royal Engineers officers' swords are generally more sought after. Now here's something you won't see often on my channel, but also something you won't see me say often on my channel, and that is, I'm not entirely sure what this is. I do know vaguely what this is. So it's, first of all, it's German. Secondly, it's World War One era, so again. Uh, so most of these swords are World War One era in this particular collection. Um, and this P-shaped guard, has its origin in the British 1796 like cavalry sabre because according to Napoleon the British were a nation of shopkeepers the reason he called us that was because in the Napoleonic Wars uh, when we were pushed out of uh, Karuna the retreat from Karuna a bit like Dunkirk in World War II um, we essentially we couldn't fight back directly against Napoleon on land. We did at sea, of course, but uh, on land, we couldn't fight in mainland Europe for a while while we built up forces. Um, so what we did instead was we sold armaments, much like today, we sold weapons and armaments to the people we wanted to do our fighting for us, like proxy war. And obviously, the German states, what we'd now call Germany, had been invaded by Napoleon's armies, and the Germans were fighting back, like Blücher and all of his friends. And so we equipped them, we armed them with all sorts of things, including muskets and swords. And the British 1796 Light Cavalry Sabre went to Prussia, was hugely popular, and they copied it in 1811 with the so-called Blucher Sable, uh, the, the, the Blucher Sabre, but really it was just based on the British 1796. There's some, there's some differences, but they're quite minor. So much so that sometimes people buy a Blucher thinking it's a 1796, and then they're like, ah, I wanted a British sword, and they find out it's German. Um, because it has to be said, the British ones sell for more and are more commercially desirable than the German ones. But the Prussians kept making that sword right the way through the 19th century, but then they changed it, it morphed into other models. And ultimately, by World War I, we ended up with this model carried by Artillery officers, so I believe that this is a German World War I artillery officer's sabre. Um, and you'll see, oh, there we go, you'll see it's got a quite a narrow, very, very narrow blade compared to a 1796. Really narrower than most spadroons. 
and really you could say it's almost a dress item. Now that's not to say that if sharpened up you couldn't do a lot of, I mean certainly this was heads and necks and legs would be and forearms and hands. You could, like a rapier, you could definitely slash them to to uh, to hell with, with a sharpened up one of these. And the point of course used as the thruster will still be perfectly effective just like a small sword or a rapier is. But as a sabre it's very very narrow. Um, but there we go. The reason I say that I don't know 100% what this is, is it's possible that this isn't artillery because I don't see any artillery emblems on it. And this model of sword or swords like this were also carried by officials like police um, and certain other military staff as well. So I'm not 100% sure that this is artillery. It might be something else, but it is, I'd say, definitely German slash Prussian and definitely World War One era. And I need to do a bit of research to find out exactly uh, who would have carried this. So second to last sword, it's yet another 1897. But don't dismay, there's a couple of things which are interesting about this. Firstly, it is not George V. It's the only one here that's not. If we look at the front of the guard there, come on camera, that is ERV11, okay, which is Edward VII. Why is that interesting? Edward VII became, um, came before George V. So Queen Victoria died in 1901, then 1901 to 1910, Edward VII, her son, formerly the Prince of Wales. He was quite old by this point, so he died in 1910. Didn't get to be king for very long, unfortunately. Unfortunately for him, anyway. Um, he seemed like he was a fairly decent king. But anyway, uh, and he had a big interest in swordsmanship and fencing, incidentally, but that, save that for another video. And um, he died in 1910, so that means that unlike the other swords here, which are all marked George V and are all probably World War I swords, this sword probably was also carried in World War I, but importantly, it was for an officer who was a career soldier, not a fresh, fresh sign up. He was a career soldier who was already in the army by 1910, because that's marked Edward VII. So therefore, Lots of soldiers who, lots of officers rather, who had um, swords marked from before George V's reign still would have been carrying those swords in World War One. Now looking at the blade, um, it's been a little bit over polished. So the, um, should we say that the etching is rather um, smoothed out, but nevertheless, it's a nice shiny blade. And it, I can see that the retailer was Flight. Now, although it's been very polished out, I know a lot of the retailers, so I recognise that. And interestingly, the proof slug, um, I won't bring it up to the camera because it probably won't focus on it, is a brass disc and it has the word Proved with a crown at the top. Now, we know this was one of Wilkinson's trade proof slugs. So, this was almost certainly made by Wilkinson in the Edwardian period and carried by a career soldier. And it, has it been service sharpened? Yes, it has been server sharpened, but only near the tip, interestingly. So whereas the other one was sharpened from down here, this one has only been sharpened around the tip, but it has been sharpened. So this was almost certainly taken to World War One. It possibly was carried in campaigns before World War One, because remember that uh, Britain, Britain's military was quite active in places like uh, India and Afghanistan and parts of Africa in the lead up to World War One, and in fact there was a very big, most people don't know about it, but there was a very big campaign in Afghanistan in 1919, straight after the First World War, and it's militarily interesting because everyone thinks about the First World War, that was the end of traditional Victorian style warfare, swords weren't used very much in World War One, blah blah blah. But when we look at the campaign in Afghanistan in 1919, it was like they just rewound the clock because that was a traditional campaign in Afghanistan with lots of cavalry and mountain artillery. And it was fought just how wars were fought before World War One because it was in Afghanistan and they, they weren't using trenches and tanks. So it was fought in a different way. Right, here is the final sword. And this is rather a different beast. That's why I saved it for last. This is a... Napoleonic era, and some people will hate me calling it Flank Officer's Sabre. We don't call these Flank Officer's Sabres anymore, but lots of books and lots of people will. And you will see that this is another one of these extremely curved, scimitar-like, as they were known at the time. Don't criticise me for using the word scimitar. It was what they called these. This was called a scimitar blade in the Napoleonic period. And the style of the hilt is actually really quite utilitarian and basic. It's a wood covered uh, leather with a straight guard instead of the P shaped, which possibly means it's earlier. This is a sort of 1788-ish style hilt, but in brass. Now, the fact it's in brass 
could, and again, some, some dealers would say that means it's naval, carried at the Battle of the Nile or blah, blah, blah. We just don't know, okay? We know that brass hilts were carried by infantry officers, by naval officers, where brass hilts good because it doesn't rust, um, but they were also sometimes carried by other people. Now, because of the blade shape and the blade length, this wouldn't be a cavalry officer's sword. However, it could be artillery. So my conclusion is this is a non-regulation circa 1790. And man, that's quite sharp still. Wowza, that's really well sharpened. Beautiful condition blade. Look how shiny that is. It's not often you see blades of this age in that condition. Um, and I'm going to oil and clean these swords down, so forgive me for doing this. It's pretty solid, in the, there's a tiny bit of movement in the guard, but pretty solid in the hilt. That is a good fighting weapon, and you're, you think about in the age of spadroons, <laughs> I'd personally rather have one of these as a fighting weapon, because I think in a melee this would be more useful, and against bayonets and hangers and things like that, and cavalry swords. Anyway, um, probably circa 1790, could be naval officer, so it could have been carried in master and commander, but equally could have been an infantry officer's sword or an artillery officer's sword or something like engineers as well. Um, so someone on foot basically rather than on horse. Um, I hope that's been entertaining and interesting. Remember um, the Antique Arms Fair if you're in London is this Saturday February the 4th. Um, I'll be there, lots of other people will be there and you can get to see more antique weapons in one place than you'd see in most museums. Um, but if you can't get there don't worry, because it's very likely that quite a bit of this stock and some other new swords will be coming to my website, linked below, Eastern Antique Arms Limited, will be coming to the website fairly soon. But even if you're not intending to buy a sword, I hope that this has been an interesting video and maybe you learned something. If you did learn something, I want to know what. What did you learn today? Post in the comments down below um, and uh, maybe you've got other questions and I can answer some of those as well. Cheers for watching and I'll see you again soon. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.